Welcome to today's Bible study with Pastor Josh Tice. The next time you're in Las Vegas, we'd love to meet you in person at Southern Hills. If you happen to watch us regularly, please like and subscribe to our YouTube channel and consider sharing this video with a friend. You can support the ministries of Southern Hills by visiting southernhillslv.com and clicking the Give tab. Now, sit back, relax, and get ready to learn how the Bible is relevant in your life today. How many of you know the price is right? How many of you know the price is right? How many of you did like me, right, growing up, the day that you didn't do school or, or off school, you, you stayed home and you ate, you're sick? You know, I'm sick. And I stay home and eat Fruit Loops and watch the price is right. How many of you, for you, it was Bob Barker was your guy? How many of you, Bob Barker, yeah? How many of you was the next guy? What's the next guy? Nobody cares. What's his name? Drew Carey, he's the other guy. And is there a new guy or is it only, oh, he is the new guy. Okay, well, they're still going on, the show's going. I always thought it would be fun. I always thought it would be so much fun to like go and line up. Anybody ever actually was in the show or not necessarily on the show, but you like, you, came, you went to the show and you saw it. How many of you ever, anybody ever did this before? Raise your hand if you did. Okay, a couple of you have. And from what I've been told, you actually have to line up early in the morning and then you go, get inside and they, they interview everybody to see who they select from the crowd to be a participant. And you have to be engaging, you have to be charismatic, you have to be exciting, willing to yell and scream. And I thought, that's me, like I could do that. I wanna, and, and they go in groups of people and they wear t-shirts and maybe you're selected. How many, of you know, how many of you would love to be picked as one of those people? How many of you like that would love to? How many of you are like, that's my worst nightmare. I do not wanna be picked as one of those people. Could you imagine, could you imagine if you're sitting there and all of a sudden you're excited about being picked, you want to be picked, and all of a sudden they shout your name, come on down, you're the next contestant on The Price is Right. And all of a sudden everybody stands and cheers and they yell your name and all, all the cameras and lights are on you and all of a sudden you get stage fright and think, I'm not going. Could you imagine if that happened? If out of the entire crowd, they picked you and you declined to go forward. I don't know if it's ever happened. But it would stop everything. In a similar way, the Bible tells us that Christ invites everybody. The Bible says that all are welcome to come and hear the message, to hear Christ and his word. But only a few are, we'll say, lucky enough, not the right word, to be chosen and smart enough to accept. I didn't say it. Matthew, the book of Matthew says it. And it's quoting Jesus in Matthew chapter 22, verse 14. For many are called, but few, few are chosen. You today are blessed. <laughs> the world calls it lucky. Enough to have been invited to church today. And you're hearing God's message. You're reading God's word. You're going to hear from God today. And that's awesome that you've been called. I, I wonder if you would be chosen today. I, I wonder if you were chosen if you were smart enough to follow Christ, to, to actually get up and leave behind everything and follow Christ. That's what today's message is about. Today's message is about when Jesus meets the fishermen who become some of the great followers of Jesus Christ. If you're new here, you find yourself in the midst of a five-week sermon series in the Gospel of Luke. And we are week number three, you're smack dab in the middle of this stud study that we're talking about, we call it dark horses. People that Jesus picks for his team. People that you would have never expected that Jesus would pick for his team. Jesus goes out of his way to pick those kind of people. And today we're talking about the moment Jesus picks the fishermen, Peter and Andrew, James and John, to be his followers. And they, thank God, are lucky enough and blessed enough and smart enough to accept the challenge to follow Christ. Let's go ahead and see this question today. 
If chosen, would you follow Jesus? That's the question that we have for you today. I want you as an individual to not think about your parents. I want you as an individual to not think about your cousin. I want you as an individual not to think about your children. I want you to think about you. If Christ chose you to follow him, would you follow Jesus? Because today I do believe that's exactly what will happen. I believe God has brought you here and he is selecting you to follow him. The question is, will you? And as we look at this question, there are three words that I want us to focus on, three things that I want you to be. Number one, available. Number two, obedient. Number three, ready. Available, obedient, ready. That's the whole sermon. Let's say it together. Available, obedient, ready. Say it again. Available, obedient, ready. One more time. Available, obedient, ready. The first thing I want you to be, and we see this in the story today, is I want you to be available when Jesus calls. Available when Jesus calls. Available. The best ability is availability. The best ability is availability. We see this true in the life of Simon Peter. We see this true in the life of his brother Andrew with their business partners, James and John. Look at what it says in verses one through three. So it was as the multitude pressed around Jesus, as the multitude came in around Jesus to hear the word of God that he stood by the lake of Gennesaret. What's happening? Well, if you're new to Southern Hills, we're in the midst of the story of Jesus found in the gospel of Luke or the story that's written here in the Bible called Luke's gospel. And what we just learned is that Jesus has been going from town to town in a region called Galilee around the great lake of Gennesaret or the Sea of Galilee. And as he goes from place to place teaching, the Bible says he's now picking people to be part of his discipleship team, his followers, his young ones that will be following him and his message. Now the Bible says he's teaching beside the seashore of the lake. And when he does, the Bible says there pressed around him multitudes of people. How many is a multitude? Do you know? Maybe a multitude, a few dozen, maybe a few hundred, maybe thousands. We don't know in this number. We just know it's a great crowd. And it's starting to get a little, you know, claustrophobic. All the people pressing in on Jesus. Now, this is cool because I find this to be the case. Why are all these people following Jesus? Could it be because he is there preaching the word of God unto them? I find it's been true throughout history. When you preach the word of God, people press in to hear the word of God. People are sick and tired of being told others' opinions. They want to hear the word of God. And here it is true as well. Jesus, in the midst of the Galilee, has been teaching God's word, and so he is gathering great crowds around him. The Bible says in verse 2, and Jesus saw the two boats standing by the lake. Jesus looks up. And he notices there are two boats anchored right by the seashore. And the fishermen had gone from them and were washing their nets. The people who owned the boats were away. They were washing their nets because they had fished all night. They had caught nothing. And what fishermen have to do is wash their nets before they put them up for the day when they go home to go to bed. Verse 3, then he got into the one of the boats. Jesus sees the boats and gets into the boat. I love how Jesus didn't even ask permission. He just got right onto the guy's boat. Now we find out that this is a guy named Simon. We know Simon. Later his name will be Peter. We know him from the previous story. If you remember, Jesus was teaching in the synagogue a few weeks ago. And the Bible says that after Jesus was done teaching, he left the house or left the, the, the synagogue to go next door to a man's house for lunch. It was Simon's house. So he already knows this guy. He sees Simon out there washing his nets with his partners. Jesus just gets inside of the boat. The Bible says as he's standing there, uh, which was Simon's, he asked Simon to put the boat a little further from the land. And then it says, he sat down and taught the multitudes from the boat. So because there was a great crowd, they pushed the boat a little further from the land. And Jesus, the Bible says, does this, probably so the whole crowd could see him. Probably also because the natural water on the seashore would have been like an acoustic so that everybody could hear him. And Jesus sits down. I don't know, can you imagine Jesus kind of just hanging his feet off of the edge of the boat? Well, they anchor about 20 yards back, and Jesus starts teaching the crowd. Could you imagine? How many of you would love to be there like I would love to be there? How many of you would love to? Wouldn't that be amazing? 
sit there and hear Jesus teach the word of God to the people from the boats? What is Jesus doing in that moment? I believe what Jesus is doing in that moment is what he did throughout his entire life and what he's doing even now. He is calling out a few people to follow him. The question is, will they follow? So I ask a question. Why did Jesus pick Peter's boat? You ever think about that? Like, why, why, why not the other boats around? Wanting to go farther down. But I, could it be possible? It's just me theorizing. Could it be possible because <laughs> the boat was right there? Isn't that how the story plays out? Jesus is walking down. People are pressing in. He sees two boats. He picks the boat. Why did he pick that boat? Jesus, why that boat? Because that boat was there. It was available to him. This is what I find about Jesus over and over in Scripture and what I find to be true in my life. Jesus often picks what is most accessible to him because Jesus can use anybody or anything. Did Jesus pick the best boat in all of the lake? No, he just picked the boat that he was right there. The best ability I have found is availability. The reason why God uses some people is not because those people are better than other people. The reason God uses some people is because they're available to be used by God. Do you know why God chose Heather and I to start Southern Hills and be leaders here? Do you know why? Say, man, because pastor, like, you're a great, wonderful person. I know, but besides that, Can I be honest with you? That is not. Man, Pastor, you're such a good preacher and she's such a good counselor. That is not the way it started. Can I tell you about my first sermon? The first time I preached, I was 17 years old. I had just told my dad, who is also a preacher, that God was calling me to be a preacher. And he said, awesome, that's great. I'll let you preach next Sunday night. And I said, fantastic. I wasn't nervous. You think, oh, were you nervous? Are you kidding me? I'm ready to go. I know what I'm doing. I'm 17 years old, called of God to preach. Come on, baby, let's get this thing going. And so I picked a passage. Now, if you were to guess what passage in the Bible would be the worst passage in the Bible to preach, the worst book of the Bible, guess it. I want somebody to shout out. What would be the worst book of the Bible to preach from in all of the Bible? What would it be? Song of Solomon, yeah. No, it, that would be a bad book to preach. <laughs> Song of Solomon would be a bad book to preach for your first sermon. It wasn't that. I picked Leviticus. Now, if you're new to Christianity, you've never read the Bible, Leviticus is like, it's, it's, it, uh, it's, it's a chore, right? It's a chore. I'm preaching from Leviticus. My first sermon, I get up. And uh, I, I open up, I'm like, turn in your Bibles to Leviticus. Here's something that happens with new preachers. Normally, they're so nervous, they preach for like three or four minutes. They read the Bible. They're like, this is what the Bible says. Uh, you know, just do it. And then they leave. Like, that's the, the three-minute sermon. Me, I got up, and I, from Leviticus, I preached for 45 minutes. I made zero sense. <laughs> My father pulled me down after the service, sat me down. He said, we've got to talk, man. He said, he began to outline like all the things I did wrong, all the things that I said wrong, all the things I was preaching about murmuring. He said, first of all, you were really angry. Why were you so angry? I'm like, I don't know. I felt like I should yell at everybody. He's like, you did. You yelled at everybody. In the middle of my sermon, this is, not, this is absolute true. In the middle of my sermon, I said, I said, that's the way it is. And if you don't like it, there's the back door. That's what I said in my first sermon. Uh, It was great. It was good. It was good times. It was not my ability. Heather, you say, man, Heather's a great counselor. That's why God chose you guys to start that. Heather's a great counselor. She was not always a great counselor. I got to tell you, man, I got to tell you, the very first time I sat with Heather in a counseling session, we're pastoring now. I'm only, we're like 24, 25 years old. There's this couple going through this really bad traumatic family thing. And they're fighting with each other. It's not going well. Heather and I are in their home giving counsel. And one of the things you're taught as a counselor is not to become emotional if they become emotional. That's an easy, obvious thing. 
But Heather has such a heart for people and her heart is so big, she started becoming so emotional in the moment while they're fighting with each other. She begins to cry and she stands up and she stomps her foot and she starts yelling at them, stop fighting, stop it, stop it. She's crying, you're just destroying your lives. You're just destroying your family. And it freaked out this couple so much, they came and put their arms around Heather. Is this true or what? And they're like, it's okay, Heather. We're going we're gonna to work it out. We're, I swear, we're going to work it out. <laughs> it's true. And she's like, and the whole time I'm like, oh, no, 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 no. This is not going well. You know, I'm, I'm convinced. We've been doing this for like 20 years now. I'm convinced. Do you know why it is that God picked us? Not because of our ability, but because of our availability. If you are hung up on your abilities, God will never be able to use you. Some of you are hung up because you don't perceive your abilities. You're like, I, I have nothing to offer God. You're perfect. God uses people with no abilities so that it shows it was obvious God that did it. Now, if you're hung up on your abilities on the other end, you're like, I got lots of abilities. When is God going to pick me? It's going to be a very long time. What you're going to go through is a lot of humiliating, humbling things in life to where you're broken and you have nothing. Then God will be like, then you'll be like, I have nothing. And God will be like, now you're ready. The number one ability that you need in following Christ is not any other ability other than availability. You say, man, if I'm got called of God to do something, hear, hear what I'm trying to say. If God calls you to it, he will equip you for it. Some of you are right now on the precipice of a major decision in your life. And you're wondering to yourself, do I have what it takes? Some of you are right there. You're about to make some decisions about going to college. And you're like, I don't know if I have what it takes, the finances or the funding. I don't know if I have the academic credentials. I don't know if I have what it takes. Here's what I'm telling you, my friend. Listen to me, my young person. Listen to me. If God calls you to it, he'll equip you for it. Some of you are about to face a major career shift right now. Some of you are thinking about buying a house for the first time. Some of you are thinking about going into civil service or even politics. And you're thinking to yourself, I'm not sure I can do it. I'm not sure I have what it takes. The best ability is availability. If God calls you to it, he'll equip you for it. Some of you are thinking starting a business or maybe you're getting involved in a small group or maybe even God would have you start a small group. Some of you have been thinking about missions or short-term missions trips to go to Africa or to go to Asia or to go help people that are most in need. And some of you are like, I'm not sure that I can do it. I don't have the abilities. And to that, I would say, if God calls you to it, he'll equip you for it. The first and primary thing I want you to see and I want you to be, if God is choosing you for something special, hear me, number one, available, be available. Number two, be obedient. Number two, be obedient. Why? The doorway to knowledge is obedience. Can you say that with me? The doorway to knowledge is obedience. Hear me? If God were going to ask you to do something, how long would you argue with God before you did it? You know, I wish in my life I could say never. But I argue with God a lot. I don't know about that. There have been many times in my life God's like, hey, why don't you do? And you're like, what? <laughs> that? Wrong number. Wrong number, God. I think you've called somebody other than me. One of the things you'll find in the Bible is that all throughout the Bible, you come across individual after individual. These are, quote, unquote, the heroes of the Bible. And it seems like every hero of the Bible has a part of the story where he's arguing with God. Have you noticed that? Moses argues with God. Abraham argues with God. Daniel argues with God. Esther argues with God. Now you get to Peter. And in Peter's story, you're like, Peter! 
Well, Peter, for sure, you know he's going to argue with God. Look, look at what happens in the story. It goes on in verses 4 through 10. And when Jesus had stopped preaching and speaking, he said to Simon Peter, launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. Now, before we go on, let me ask you a question. What has Peter been doing all night? What has Simon Peter been doing all night? What has he been doing? You tell me. What has he been doing? He's fishing. He's a fisherman. He's been fishing all night. Now he's done fishing. He's washed his nets, which is what fishermen have to do before they put them up for the day when they go to sleep. So they've been fishing all night long. And Jesus is like, okay, now you can go fishing. Let's go out, launch out, go out. Come on, let's go. Done. Let's go. Peter, Peter. Hey, hey, Peter. Let's go out and we'll go fishing. I find it interesting that a carpenter, Jesus, suddenly becomes an expert fisherman and he's going to tell the lifelong fisherman when to fish. What do you do when Jesus tries to get into your business and tell you your life? What do you do when Jesus starts to tell you your business? Your expertise, right? There's not a lot of things you're an expert in, but there's some things you are an expert in. There's some things you know more than most people know. And then when somebody tries to come in and tell you your business, you're kind of like, okay, step back, Jack. I know not all things, but I know what I'm doing. And then Jesus, who is not a fisherman, comes into you and says, hey, yeah, by the way, I don't want you doing that anymore. I want you to do this. And you're like, ah, you're a carpenter. How about you stick to your thing and I'll do my thing? And that's exactly what Peter, Simon Peter does. Look, look, at what he, look at what he says in this passage. But Simon answered him and said, Master, we have toiled. I like how he begins with master. Isn't it wonderful to uh, fight with Jesus when you begin like, Lord, <laughs> if he really was the master, you would obey. Master, but we have toiled all night and caught nothing. Can I just stop and say this? I don't think, some of you, this will be blasphemous. It's okay, you've been here for a while. I do it every week. All right, are you ready? I don't think it's wrong to argue with God as long as he wins the argument. He says to him, Master, we've fished all night, and then we see Peter twist in a moment pivot. And then he says, I love his next words, nevertheless, at your word, I will let down the net. There's initial pushback. There's an initial argument. There's an initial fight to God. And then he says, I will obey. Obedience. The doorway to knowledge is obedience, obedience, obedience. And when they had done this, they caught the great number of fish and their net was breaking. Immediately they go out, they put the nets down and all of a sudden all sorts of fish fill the net. Look, it goes on how crazy this miracle was. So they signaled to their partners, this is James and John, to the other boat, and they came to help them. These people were not just expert fishermen. They were businessmen with a large, small business that they brought together. They know their business. Guess what? God knows your business better than you know your business. And they they came and they filled both boats. So filled were the boats that the boats began to sink. So how is Simon Peter going to respond to this? When Simon Peter saw it, the Bible says he fell down at Jesus' knees saying, depart from me for I am a sinful man, O Lord. Man, you got to love Peter. I love Peter. Peter is always saying the wrong thing at the wrong times, putting his foot in his mouth. He's just an idiot. You know what I mean? He really is. And the Bible is very clear on who this guy is, just always making the wrong decisions. And that's why I relate with Peter so much. I argue with God and then end up, end up obeying. I say the wrong thing and end up finally obeying. I, I, I understand him like you understand Peter. And then in that moment, Peter, yes, argue with God. And then the next moment, he turns around and he's like, God, you are God. I'm sorry. I'm terrible. You ever feel that way with God? You ever feel like the pattern in your life is like, I don't know what you're telling me what to do. I'm sorry, tell me what to do. (laughs) You ever feel that way with God? I'll do what I want, forgive me. I wanna do what you want me to do. You ever feel that? You're just like Peter. 
And he gets down on his knees and he calls upon God and says, I'm a sinful man, O Lord. And he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch which the fish that they had taken. And so also were James and John, the sons of Debedee, the partners with Simon. Every single one of them were amazed. Hey, if the first great ability is availability, the second great ability is teachability. Here's why Peter ended up being a great man. Because not only was he available, he was teachable. Do you know how to limit your ability to accomplish anything in life? Become a know-it-all. And what I found in life is that if you really want the knowledge and the understanding, you have to walk through the doorway of obedience. I was at men's retreat last week with you, Stephen. We had a great time. There's also stuff that we do at men's retreat. And at the church, if you're new here, we have stuff for ladies all the time and stuff for men all the time. And there's exciting women's conference coming up in a couple weeks. And we just came back from men's retreat. And one of the things that uh, is not on the official schedule that I do every year is after everybody goes to bed, uh, there's a bunch of us guys that stay up and we play board games like late into the evening. I think this last last one, we stayed up till one or two o'clock playing board games. How many of you like board games? I love playing board games, man. I, and so we sat down and, and we're going to play a game called Settlers of Catan. Any nerds out there, you know what I'm talking about? Settlers of Catan? Well, we already knew you're a nerd, but did you play the game too? Yeah, all right, all right, very good. So that, so how many, let, let me see, Settlers of Catan, anybody play this? So it's a really fun game, but it's kind of complicated to learn at the beginning. And we sat down and we sat down, all of us were sitting down and we're like, okay, let's play. And we're getting ready to play and we find out, how many of you not played? Like four out of the six guys ready to play had never played. And I'm like, are you kidding me? You've never played? They're like, no, teach us. And I'm like, oh, no. Because it's no fun to play with people that don't know what they're doing. So I'm looking around. I'm like, anybody else know how to play? Because they want to be your partner. They want to help. You want to help? You want to be on somebody's team? You know what I mean? Like you're talking to a seven-year-old. You can be on John's team. Nobody else wanted to, so I'm like, all right, let's teach the guys how to play. And this one guy, we were there, I forgot who it was, but he started going through the rule book, you know what I mean? He's like, well, first thing you must know is, and he's starting to read the rule book and trying to explain it, and it takes forever. And the guy's just like, rule number 74, and rule number 97 is, and if you're new to a game, you're sitting there like, I don't know what you're talking about. And if you've ever tried to do this before, eventually somebody at the table says, what? Let's just play. Let's just play. Like, forget it, let's just play. Why? You just play a hand, let's play a game, let's just play. You'll figure it out as you go. Why? The reason is, is because understanding and knowledge often doesn't come before, it often comes when you take a step through. Obedience. The doorway to knowledge is through the pathway of obedience. Do you know how God deals with us? He says to you, here's what I want you to do. And what many of you, you know what your next step is. I don't know what it is, but you know what your next big step is. For some of you, your next big step is to be baptized. You saw people getting baptized. You're like, I'm supposed to do that. For some of you, it's to become a church member. For some of you, it's to join a small group. For some of you, it's to be a small group leader. For some of you, it's to go on mission. For some of you, it's a next big step. I don't know what it is. There's a million next steps. But you already know what it is God wants you to do. And what you're waiting for is an email from God with a 25-page PDF explaining all the information you need to know to finally make the decision. You're not getting the email. Because even if you got the email, you would not understand all of the knowledge God was giving you. Because obedience is the doorway to understanding. You're not going to get it until you go through it. What is God calling you to do? What are you sitting around waiting for? That God's going to explain all the details so that finally you're comfortable because now it won't take faith. What's the step God's calling you to? Take it, my friend. Take the step. As you take the step of obedience, knowledge and understanding will finally be, finally be yours. I believe it's absolutely okay to argue with God as long as he wins every time. 
Available is what I want you to be. Why? Because the best ability is availability. Obedient. Why? Because the doorway to knowledge is obedience. And the third thing I want you to be today before we leave, we'll learn from the passage. I want you to be ready. If you are obedient, friend, if you are available, I want you to be ready. Because only the empty hand can receive. If God calls you to something, it's because he has something for you. But so often to receive what God has for you, you have to let go of what you already have. Isn't that what Jesus does here with Simon Peter? And Jesus said to Simon, do not be afraid. Hey, look at me. Some of you are really scared right now. You're afraid. You're like, man, I, if I were to do that thing, do not be afraid, Jesus says to Peter. From now on, you will catch men. You used to be a fisher of fish. Now you will be a fisher of men. So when they had brought their boats to the land, they forsook all and followed Jesus. They left behind their business. They left behind their nets. They left behind their, their fishing equipment. They left behind everything. Some of you are like, yeah, that's the way it is. I followed Jesus, and to follow Jesus, boy, it took a lot of courage because I had to leave everything behind. What did you leave? Like, really, what is Peter really leaving here? To really understand this point, we have to remember the night that Peter just had. Did Peter just have a good night or a bad night? For those of you who don't remember, he was fishing all night. Anybody ever fish all night and catch nothing? I have. I hate Lake Mead. I hate that lake. I'm a fisherman. I'll catch fish anywhere you put me. That lake doesn't have fish. You say, yes, it does. No, it doesn't. It has no fish in that whole lake. Drives me, yeah, I caught a fish. You lie, you, you, you lie. You went to Albertsons, bought a fish that was already dead, hooked it on and pulled it up, took a picture. That's what you did. There's no fish in that, I know there's no, I've, I, all night I fished, no fish. Man, it drives you nuts. You wait, at the end of the day, you pull the boat in or you come home with, with your friends and you're driving home and you're just like, that was a wait, I hate, this is stupid, I'm never, this is, ugh, the, it's so frustrating. That's where Peter is. But Peter's not out there fishing for fun. Peter's out there as his livelihood, for his business, for his family. He needs to feed his family and sell fish to pay for his bills and his taxes. Peter is freaking out, man. He is stressed out. His whole life is a mess right now. Why is he out fishing all night? He's out fishing all night because he has to fish all night and he gets nothing. He gets nothing. He's at the end of his rope. He's at the end of himself. And then Jesus comes in and says, here, I've got a proposition for you. Why don't you leave all that behind and follow me? And Peter's like, leave all what behind? It's nothing. I'm going to take you from being a fisher who hopefully catches a few fish so that you can pay a few bills to becoming a water walker. Christian, you're thinking about it wrong if you're thinking to yourself, well, I gotta, I gotta let go of all these great things in my life so I can follow Jesus. What it really means to become a disciple of Jesus is suddenly your entire perception of yourself elevates and suddenly you are now, huh, you're a miracle kingdom worker. Your old life is gone and good riddance, it was going nowhere anyway. Now again, some of you might be thinking to yourself, I don't know, my old life is going pretty good. Trust me, friend, if God is really choosing you and pulling you along, he's gonna get you to a place where you realize your old life is nothing. And then he'll say, now you can follow me. Your world will change. It'll open up like never before. But what you've got to do, friend, is be willing to be ready because only an empty hand can, can receive. Is it possible that God has been calling you to do something where he's going to have you let go of something little in order to receive something great? Like next week, we have this 
giant pledge for the new building. And some of you, God has been telling you specifically, I want you to pledge to give this amount over the next three years. And you're like, oh. We'll never receive until we let go. I have a friend who tells a story. He's a preacher. He tells a story about his, um, his family going into an antique shop. He goes into this antique shop one day, and I'll close with this. He goes into this antique shop, having a great time, looking around with his family, his wife, and his little two- or three-year-old little girl must have been in the other room. And somehow, in the midst of the shopping, he hears a cry. Ah! And he realizes it's his daughter, and his heart sinks. Immediately, he thinks of the safety of his daughter. And he runs into the other room, and he's scared for her. He sees her. And her harm is, is, is deep down inside of a beautiful vase. And immediately, he thinks, oh, no, the safety of my daughter. And the second thought he had, because he's a father, is, oh, no, how much is that? <laughs> and his hands her hand deep down inside of the vase and she's trying to pull it out and there's an employee there trying to help pull it out. As he's trying to pull it out, suddenly the mom comes around the corner and all the family's there. Now it's kind of make a ruckus. She's starting to cry, my arm, my arm, I can't get it out, I can't get it out. And so they try to get some lubricant. They put some oil and they, they try to allow that down. There's some lotion and they're just pulling it out still when it come out, when it come out. It became very evident, very clear, very obvious, very soon that the only way for them to get the arm out was to break the vase. So the dad said, okay, I'll do it, I'll do it. And they gave him a little hammer and he came over and he looked at the vase, looked at the little girl's eyes, she's crying. He looked at the vase, quickly peeked at the price tag, oh no. <laughs> no, 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 no. This is gonna cost him, it's gonna cost the whole family, it's gonna be a problem. So he taps and cracks and taps and cracks and taps and cracks and she's starting to be relieved and cracks around and finally the whole thing just falls off. And he notices his daughter's hand is, is like a fist. It's grasping something and he looks at his daughter and she looks up with smiles and tears and he says, what's in your hand? And she very proudly holds up a quarter. That little girl had seen a quarter inside that vase, reached down, grabbed the quarter, and could not get her arm out because her fist was keeping it from coming out. And so she got her quarter. <laughs> but the whole family lost a great amount of money. I wonder if you holding on to your little quarter is actually costing you more than you realize. I don't know what it is that God is calling you to be available for. I don't know what it is God is calling you to be obedient to. I don't know what it is that God is saying, let go so that you can receive whatever it is, friend. I'm just thankful that God's willing to choose me and call me. And every time I've let go in life, God has filled me with more capacity than I could ever receive. We're going to see this as we continue to follow the lives of Simon Peter and his friends. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I thank you for your word. I pray that we would understand it, we would apply it, and we would live it. I pray that today you would help each and every one of us, Father, be available, ready, and be obedient. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for watching Josh Tice's most recent Bible sermon. If you think of someone who may enjoy this one, go ahead and send it or post it today. If you're ever in Las Vegas on Sunday, we'd love for you to stop by Southern Hills and see us in person. If you benefit from this virtual ministry, we'd also like to encourage you to support our gospel efforts by sending a donation to the ministries of Southern Hills. You can do so by visiting southernhillslv.com and clicking the Give tab.